Carolyn got a contact last night from someone we had not uh, been in communication with for about 50, uh, I can't hardly say it, 50 years. And of all the things she could have asked, she only asked one question. She asked Carolyn, is Don still funny? <laughs> and I think she messaged back, well, he's gotten funny looking. So uh, a <laughs> lot can happen in 50 years. Delighted you are here today. Thank you, Christy. Wow, what a ministry niche, one that's greatly needed. Be praying for you. Uh, you notice our pastors are all in dark suits this morning. I, I'm not sure what that, it looks like we're all in mourning. Uh, I, I may, and there seems to be a subliminal connection, wavelength that we're all on, which is kind of scary, isn't it? all in our dark suits. But I really think it's because of the, the sky this morning was gloomy and, and the rain was coming. But tomorrow, they're talking about upper 70s, one of, the, one of the nicest places in the country to be tomorrow. So I'm giving all of you the day off tomorrow, <laughs> including myself. This is my favorite time of the year. I love spring, absolutely love it. There's new life budding everywhere. The robins and the cardinals have returned to our backyard. The grass is green now. Some trees are beginning to bud. And throughout the church and across this state, there's going to be a rather intense bouts of hay fever. So bring your tissue and, and cover up, and, and please don't sit behind me, okay? That's all I ask. While I was in my car this week, uh, I was doing my best to avoid potholes. Uh, and you can't text and avoid potholes, so don't text, all right? Uh, but I was doing my best to avoid potholes and not being very successful at it. But I was, I was pondering uh, that's what preachers do. We ponder. I was pondering our missions week. What a phenomenal week that was. And I'm always impressed. I always have so many takeaways. And I think the, the one that always gets me is I'm always awestruck by the inherent power of the gospel. We have nothing to be ashamed of. This gospel works everywhere it goes. Cross any ocean, go into any continent, infiltrate any culture in any century, and the gospel changes lives. And so I'm just excited. I am the, I am the luckiest guy around. I'm just excited this morning that I have the privilege and the joy of preaching that gospel today. And I find it all so fulfilling and exciting. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get up at 6 o'clock to golf. I wouldn't do that. Sorry. I'm that much of a not morning person that I wouldn't get up to golf at 6. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get up at 6 in the morning to go fishing or, or, or go hunting. I wouldn't get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to have breakfast with you. I mean, I like you, but not that much. But I'll get up any morning at 6 o'clock to preach the gospel. It brings such joy. And I hope it will bring joy to your heart as we turn to 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 1, and we continue our series on the book of 1 Corinthians. We have been in chapter 1 with Pastor Weaver. We ventured into chapter 2 with Pastor Austin, and now we're, we're backtracking uh, so we can emphasize the verse 18 through verse 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of the cross, Paul acknowledges, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I would destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world 
through its wisdom, did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ, crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. The title of my message today is The Foolishness of God. And of course, that is self-contradictory. There is no foolishness with God. God is incapable of thinking any thought or speaking any word or performing any act that could ever be called foolish. The Apostle Paul is speaking of the world's appraisal of God's actions. In the world's mind, God's ways seem foolish. And Paul uses the word foolish and foolishness, perhaps you've noticed, five times in this brief text. Four of those times, it is in reference to the world's view of God's Word and God's ways. Note what he says in verse 18, the message of the cross, foolishness. Verse 21, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to Gentiles. Verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. He uses that word five times. Those are four. The fifth time in verse 20, the word foolishness is used to speak of God's appraisal of the world's so-called wisdom. So in, in a sense, we have the world calling God foolish and God calling the world foolish. Now, who are you going to believe? Who's the fool here? Is it God, or is it, in verse 20, this age? In verse 21, this world? And that's what this text is really all about. Who are you going to believe? Well, let's look at, uh, first of all, the world's wisdom. And the Apostle Paul throws out the challenge in verse 20. He's taking on the world with this challenge. And he's saying, listen up, world. Where is the wise man? Where is the teacher, the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Come forth. Let's examine your work. Let's appraise your contribution to mankind. Let's see if your wisdom is really wisdom at all. The fact is, what the world thinks is wisdom is foolishness. And Paul said the world, through its wisdom, through all of its wisdom, did not know him. What a statement, and never a truer one. What an indictment. You can't know God through man's efforts. You can't know God through the scholar or the poet, or the philosopher. You can't know God on man's terms. You have to come to God God's way. You have to come to God on God's terms, and God's terms are Christ and the cross. There's no way God is going to let any of us circumvent His plan or bypass His Son or negate His cross. And yet that has been man's attempt all through man's history. Man's way to God is based on human ingenuity and intellectual pride. Man's way to God gives man the credit for finding his way. But man is lost. He is in darkness. He is in no condition to know the way. Man thinks the answer lies within him. But the answer is beyond him. The answer must come from God. 
And God's answer is just not what man wants to hear because God's answer crushes all human pride. Now there's a subtlety to man's pride. Few men, although in increasing numbers that there seems to be exceptions to it, but few men would stand before God and stick out their chest and wave their fist at Him and call God foolish. But in their neglect, in their dismissiveness, in their preoccupation with everything but God, they declare their conviction that God is irrelevant and the cross is foolishness. Here's the problem. Nobody likes to hear it. We think we're smarter than God. The Bible says His ways are above our ways, but we think our ways are above His ways. The answer to society's ills, the answer to man's greatest, deepest needs are not found in anything that man can produce. I think we've had enough history to demonstrate that. It requires what God brings to the discussion. It takes Christ, who is identified here as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Without Christ, there's no power to save. There's no wisdom to know how to be saved. We think we're so smart sometimes, don't we? But remember, my friend, it was smart people who replaced the original Coke with new Coke. Seventy-nine days later, after getting $8,000, 8,000 calls a day from irate customers, Peter Jennings broke into regular programming to announce they put the original formula back on the market and a nation was saved. It was smart people in the 1970s, top scientists, Ehrlich, Holdren, Schneider, who were warning us of an impending ice age. We're still here. Nobody here froze to death. It was smart people who built the Titanic and boasted it was unsinkable. And it was until its maiden voyage. <laughs> smart people built the Titanic. Amateurs built the ark. It was smart people who, with great fanfare, announced the invention that was going to revolutionize modern society, the Segway, <laughs> that two-wheeled personal transporter was going to be bigger than the personal computer. That was 20 years ago. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have a Segway? So much for man's wisdom. But now let's note God's wisdom. In this passage, the wisdom of the world is to the wisdom of the world is to be taken tongue in cheek as a word of irony, but so is that phrase, the foolishness of God. Paul's just playing with you. The world thinks it is wise, and the world thinks God is foolish. But the joke's on them. They have it all wrong. They couldn't be more wrong. And they don't have a clue they're wrong. There's an abundance of evidence that they're wrong, but they don't see the evidence. God's foolishness is infinitely wiser than man's wisdom. God's weakness is infinitely stronger than man's might. On his worst day, God is infinitely better than man on his best day. So the world says God is foolish. If God is foolish, what is God's foolishness? How and when did he act in such a way that the world would appraise his actions as foolish? Well, Paul answers that. He answers it clearly and consistently in verse 18. 
He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness. Verse 21, the foolishness of what was preached. And what was preached? Verse 23, Christ crucified. This cross business hmm, doesn't sit well with the world. The world was insulted and slighted by such a notion that we come to God through the cross. It's got other ideas like good works and climbing the ladder and showing what it can do. You know, anything to say, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at my accomplishments. Look at my success, my ingenuity, my persistence, my brilliance. Look at my righteousness. Who needs the cross when I've got me? And the cross is a denunciation of all human pride and self-righteousness. It's always been that way. Paul points that out in the cultural context in which he lives. He, first of all, speaks of the Jew, and he says, the Jews, they don't, they're not interested in hearing about the cross. The Jew, to them, a cross was not what they wanted. It's not what they were expecting. Not a cross. They wanted a king. I mean a real king, you know, with a throne and an army. They wanted a political kingdom and a physical kingdom right now, right here. They wanted a God warrior to break the yoke of Rome. And Paul shows up talking about a cross? Really? A mutilated Messiah? A crucified king? And the very idea of one crucified on a tree was a, a curse in the Jewish mind. It says so right in their Torah. To them it was unthinkable, unacceptable that one who had died on a cross could possibly be God's chosen one. What an absurdity. And then Paul speaks to the Greek and the, the Greeks. They're not interested in the cross because he says they have their own ideas about how God should be conducting himself. In their view, God was apathia, unable to feel without apathy. You see, the Greeks argued that if God can feel joy or sorrow or anger or grief, it, it means that someone has influenced God, and the, therefore they were greater than God. So a God who suffered in any way in their minds was, was a contradiction in terms. And their idea of God was that he was utterly detached. The very idea of incarnation, an up-and-close God, God becoming a man, much less a man who would die, was revolting to the Greek. And so here again comes Paul. Paul, with his message, the Word became flesh, and that flesh was nailed to a cross. Unthinkable. And by the way, this is still our message. Nothing has changed. And by the way, nothing needs to be changed. This is our message, and it cannot be improved upon, and it's never outdated. No, it's for the Greek and it's for the Jew and for the ancient man and the modern man. This is our message. And the world still dismisses it as foolishness. But Paul says the message of the cross is the wisdom of God and the power of God unto salvation. Could I get an amen? amen. Thirdly, we have... God's wisdom, we have the world's wisdom, but I want you to see that Paul points out the believer's wisdom. The wisdom of the believer is seen in a couple of ways here. First of all, in, in, in his very belief. In verse 21, look what he says. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Belief is not a light matter. It's not a tip of the head. It's not an intellectual acknowledgement. It's all in. It's believing with everything within you, committing with everything within you. 
And when we believe, like Paul's speaking of belief, it's a transaction, my friend, that leads out of darkness into light, out of despair into hope, out of bondage into freedom. And we become something. We become something we weren't before. We become new creations. And that change is real, and it's radical, and it's relational. And our belief in Jesus pretty much changes everything. Our belief in Jesus brings us, us into fellowship with other believers, and we call them brothers. And it brings us into fellowship with Jesus, and we call him Lord. The believer's wisdom is seen in his belief, but it's also seen in his boasting. In verse 31, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, everybody's boasting in something. Everybody's relying on something. Knowledge, pedigree, experience, attainment, accomplishment, self-righteousness. But the believer knows that Christ is the only thing that is, that is truly boast-worthy. So here, here's what I got to tell you. Here's the reason I got up this morning at 6 o'clock and put on this dark suit and this tie that binds. <laughs> the man who acknowledges the foolishness of his ways, the man who comes to the place where he says, Lord, I have no wisdom, I have no answers, the man who acknowledged his weakness and says, I can't, I can't do this. I can't climb out of this hole. I can't conquer this sin in my life. I have nothing in which I can boast. The man who does that, to those God gives Christ. And the man who had nothing now has everything. Christ, the wisdom and the power of God. Let me beatitude this. Blessed are the foolish, for they shall be wise. Blessed are the weak, for they shall be strong. Blessed are the believing, for they shall be saved. But man, he's got his own ideas. He constructs his own ladder, and then he tries to climb that ladder, that ladder that's going to take him to, to the place of God's approval, that ladder that's going to take him to heaven so he does good works and he goes up a rung and he makes some sacrifices and he goes up another rung and he has some prayers and goes up another rung and he gives an offering and he has an, goes up another rung and, and on and on it goes and he keeps climbing that ladder and all his life he's climbing that ladder and then he gets to the top and he discovers his ladder is leaning up against the wrong building. Oops. You know, uh, when it comes to a couple of things, you never want to hear that word oops. Dentistry <laughs> and destination. He gets to the top and he discovers his ladders leaning up against the wrong building. All those years of building, constructing, climbing, sacrificing, trying, earning. But the cross, hear me, is God's ladder. And God has come down that ladder to lift man up and take man where man could never go on his own. That's our message. If you'll give me just a minute... Can I have three minutes? Do I hear five? <laughs> I, I didn't hear five. I'll take three. Let me speak to the church about the church. I'm talking about the church as a whole. I fear today that the, there are trends in place, powerful trends, potentially suicidal trends, destructive trends the church is following. It's going down a slippery slope and it picking up speed all the way. You see, the message of the cross is to, uh, for the message of the cross is foolishness to the world. 
and it seems all too often to the church as well. We've taken on the foolishness of the world to try to win the favor of the world. And you have to wonder, how far are we willing to go with that? Come on. How far are we really willing to go in order to be seen as relevant and enlightened and cutting-edge trendsetters? How far are we willing to go to get a crowd? Paul wrote 1 Corinthians around 55 or 56 A.D., and there's no expiration date on it. His apostolic teaching is as relevant today as it was when it was written. And so you and I, church, we have a responsibility, a holy, solemn responsibility to guard this message. Despite pressures to compromise and accommodate the fads, and the trends and the philosophies of the day, no matter how many people line up to call us outdated or out of touch. So the word for the day is it's not tolerance. It's not accommodation. It's not appeasement. It's not compromise. The word for the day is a phrase. We preach Christ crucified. But they won't like us. So get over it. Jesus didn't say go into all the world and win their approval, did he? He didn't say they hated me, but they'll love you. He didn't say they persecuted me, but they're going to praise you. He didn't say they gave me a cross, but they'll give you a crown. So whose side are you on? Whose wisdom are you buying into? We've got our message. It's the cross. Anything else is man's wisdom. And just remember, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will make foolish the wisdom of the world. What's our message? It's the cross. It's always been that way, God willing. It will always be that way. You come to the cross, you find forgiveness. You come to the cross, you find reconciliation with God. You come to the cross, you find deliverance. You come to the cross, you find hope. You come to the cross, you find the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our message, our mandate. I thank you it's been clearly presented. And I pray that our fervor for the cross and the simplicity of the message will never be weakened, compromised, or tarnished. But we will cling tenaciously to the truth that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And I pray if there's anyone here today, Lord, they're, out, they're outside the boundaries of the family circle, the faith circle, that today they will hear the Spirit's call and they will come and em- fall at the feet of the cross and embrace the Savior and leave this place with a new life, precipitated by a new vow to follow him as King of kings and Lord of lords to the ends of the earth, to the end of a life. And I pray the church, as never before, will rise up, will hear the call to take the message, guard the message, preach the message, live the message, love the message, tell the message, whoever we are and wherever you lead us. We thank you today for the cross of Jesus.